Marvin Minsky, age 88, the legendary pioneer of artificial intelligence, died on January 24, 2016. 20 years prior, when I was first imagining closer to truth and fantasizing about world-renowned thinkers who might appear, Minsky was on my A-plus wish list. Marvin personified what I'd hoped closer to truth to become, visionary, insightful, rigorous, fearless. I wanted to do what Marvin did, challenge conventional belief, taking our topic seriously, but not ourselves. Timorously, I invited Marvin to participate, asking him to fly across country to a small PBS station in Orange County, California, KOCE. I prepared myself for rejection, more likely for no response at all. Marvin accepted immediately. I do. No, I do. This special episode is a tribute to Marvin Minsky, one of my intellectual heroes along my journey, striving to get closer to truth. I first met Marvin in 1999 during the inaugural season of Closer to Truth and a roundtable discussion. Minsky appeared in three episodes, a fusillade of profound and provocative assertions, penetrating analysis, eccentric in the best sense, no posturing, no pretensions. In general, I think if you put emphasis on believing a set of rules that comes from somebody who's an authority figure, then... Uh, so then, you then there are terrible dangers. Most of the cultures exist because they've taught their people to reject new ideas. It's not human nature, it's culture nature. I regard cultures as huge parasites. I, I think each person has a lot of potential. I want people to be very unhappy that they don't understand cosmic string theory or something. <laughs> I hate happiness because that means that uh, you're not interested so, in anything. So, so you would have society be less, but that would make you more? If, yes, if we can get happiness down to one, that then everybody will, everybody will be very busy and happy in a less superficial sense. Okay, <laughs> great. I like the idea of having more options rather than less. There are all sorts of ways mankind could end up forever locked in some particular way of looking at things, but it seems to me none of them could be very good. That's why we need progress and understanding. There must be something better than all the things that humans have done so far. I loved listening to Marvin. It didn't matter whether he defended what I believed or attacked what I held dear. I wanted more. So in 2006, when producer-director Peter Getzels and I began restructuring Closer to Truth, Marvin Minsky was among our first interviews, this time one-on-one -on -one at MIT. Marvin was incisive and fiery. Even on the edges of knowledge, no topics were off limits. I'd braced myself for his scintillating, idiosyncratic, and often radical ideas on the nature of the cosmos, on the inner workings of brains and minds, and on how we might achieve immortality. What a treat. We started with brains and minds. While most neuroscientists are interested in how the brain cells work, to me, that's pretty much like trying to understand a computer from how the transistors work. It's many, many levels of organization below the important things that distinguish a human from a crayfish or a snake or whatever. And I'm interested in the question of how the, this piece of machinery, the brain, can do things like remember what it's been doing in the past and can decide that what it's doing didn't work, how does it develop new goals, and most important, how does it make a model of itself as a being in a world and think about its own future and its past and its relatives and this very high level stuff. And those are questions that neuroscientists don't like to talk about very much because they see that as too futuristic, too vague, too, too high level. Most of psychology for the last hundred years has been concerned with explaining how an animal reacts to a particular situation or condition. The idea that maybe the brain is like a big table of instructions which say, if this happens, do that, if this, and if this happens, do that. Then the interesting question is, an animal is born with a bunch of those, 
but how does it learn new ones and what kind of experiences will cause it to behave in certain ways? How does a person imagine things that aren't real and how do you react to an imaginary scene? We can do things in our head that have very little connection with the real world. So you can't understand a computer even if you know everything about its circuits, about how its transistors work. You really need to know what the procedures are and the programs. Mm -hmm. The ordinary words of popular psychology, like emotion and feeling and thinking and so forth, are hundreds of years old. And each of them is a clever way society has developed to not think about what's going on. Yeah. For example, what does feeling mean? Well, when somebody's angry, it's silly to say that's emotional. The way I look at the mind is that there are hundreds of different processes that you can engage at any time. So what happens when someone's angry? They turn off their ability to look ahead in the future. They turn on a lot of little resources that make you act quickly and you can move uh, more rapidly and with more strength, but you don't plan ahead so much. You remove most of your diplomatic abilities <laughs> and you uh, get red in the face, which is a more physical process. <laughs> and if you're lucky, it will intimidate the person so that they'll go away. You might start a fight, so it's risky. So anger is a way to think. For a long time, people have said, well, let's think of the mind as being two kinds of things, emotional and intellectual, or conscious versus unconscious, or rational versus intuitive. Mm -hmm. And these are what I call dumbbell theories. So people say, well, how could a machine be emotional as though there was something mysterious and special called emotions? A popular view is that, well, ordinary thinking is like logic, it's rational, it's cold, it's colorless, and emotions are something mysterious like adding color to a black and white drawing. Well, there's nothing mysterious about that. I think the problem is that there isn't really anything called rational. Everything depends on what goals you have and how you got them. And when you talk about a person being angry or in love or, or jealous or annoyed, that's a way to think. It's not different from thinking. Each so-called emotional state is a way that the brain is arranged to be at the moment using certain modules or parts and suppressing others. The idea of self, it's almost a verbal mistake. It comes from the naive idea that a person is two things, a body and a mind. Mm -hmm. And we know that the body changes, but once we just divide into two parts, then it's easy to say, what's a self? It's a body and a mind, and you don't break those up. But are you the same person you were five minutes ago? Of course not. You're mostly the same. Are you the same person you were when you were three years old? Well, no. Here's what I think there really is. We build in our brain a model of what we are. And the simplest model is a body and a mind, mm -hmm. but we don't have just that model. The beautiful thing about the idea of self and each person is that we have dozens of them. I have a model, you have a model of yourself as a member of a family, as a member of a profession. You're a neuroscientist, you're a TV <laughs> producer, everything. And these are each different. I feel all those things you said are true, but I still feel a sense of, 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 of undivided unity. Well, I think the sense of undivided unity comes because the first model you made is that I have a body and a mind. You got that when you were one year old or two, and that's still there as sort of the index of the others. But it's not very useful, except socially. For all everyday purposes, the idea of self is very important and very wonderful. From a cognitive point of view, uh, it's a very stupid idea, and it's an obstacle to understanding how our minds work. Well, for example, Brains are exceedingly complex, Marvin explained them. But what about consciousness, our inner sense of private experience? Marvin, of course, offered his unique perspective. You have called consciousness a suitcase word. What do you mean by that? Well, I think the word consciousness is a clever trick that we use to keep from thinking about how thinking works. And what we do is we take a lot of different phenomena and we give them all the same name, and then you think you've got it. If you think in terms of uh, the brain as a 
whole bunch of different kinds of machinery with various connections, then it, it's easy to see that it would be very hard for any one part of the brain to know what's happening in all the rest. There's just too much. Just as the president of a company, I believe the president of some technology companies are lawyers. They haven't the slightest idea what the company makes or how it works, but they know little things like we're not making enough money. When people use the word consciousness, I think it's a very strange idea that there's some wonderful property of the brain that can do so many different things, such as to remember what you've been doing recently or remember who you are and just so many things like that. But there are hundreds of kinds of awareness. There's remembering something as an image, there's remembering something as a string of words, there's remembering the, the tactile feeling of something. Most of the time you don't remember those things. And that's what you mean by suitcase, because you take all these dozens of mental activities and try to stuff them in this one place. Right, and there's no harm in that for social purposes yeah. because it's very good. Uh, when, when a word has multiple meanings, that ambiguity is often very valuable. But if you're trying to understand those processes and you've put them all in one box, then you say, where in the brain is consciousness located? There's a whole society of scientists who are trying to find the place in the brain where consciousness is. But if it's a suitcase and it's just a word for many different processes, they're wasting their time. When we analyze all these pieces of consciousness, is there anything left over that allows us to go beyond the physical world? Well, the physical world is everything we know. And uh, if somebody believes that there's another world that's, uh, that we can't see or measure, uh, they're entitled to their opinion. But I think the more you develop that idea, the more cubic centimeters of your brain you're wasting uh, with uh, questions that uh, don't make any sense and can't be answered. If there's another universe somewhere that doesn't interact with this one, then it's not physical and it's silly to worry about it. However, if there's another universe with a thinking machine and it's, it has invisible wires connected to your brain that change how you behave, then we want to build new instruments to find it. So you don't need anything more other than what we have in our craniums to explain consciousness. Well, I'd hate to feel that there's some other world and I mean, I worked very hard to become a good scientist and I studied mathematics for many years and finally proved some theorems no one else did. And I felt this was a, a great thing. It was wonderful and it was hard work. Now, if somebody comes along and says, there's a little oyster in the universe and you're the pearl <laughs> and some creator gave you this ability, well, that's very demeaning. I don't want to be dissed by saying my virtues come from a soul. It's saying nothing we do has any consequences. There's someone else just dropping these little gifts on us. Terrible idea. What would happen if you believed it? You wouldn't do anything. Some things are not Marvin could be brusque when he rejected an idea he deemed wrong-headed. So I had no doubt that Marvin would repudiate the idea of a soul but I wanted to press him, feel the sting of his critique. People often have a feeling that if there's something they don't understand very well, they could attribute it to something else, uh, to some kind of essence or spirit or soul or, or whatever. And yet that doesn't help much because along with it usually goes, please don't ask how the soul works. What are the parts of the spirit and how do they interact? What is the essence made of and what is its structure? These are very important words because at any particular point in the history of something, there are some problems that you can't understand and there are some problems that you're sure you can't understand. You may be wrong. And that's when you attribute an essence or a spirit or a soul. The people who talk about a soul are just people who are too ignorant or unambitious or lazy or I don't know what insults to hurl at them <laughs> to say, this is a really hard question. Uh, it, it's all very well to say it can't be answered, but what do you do with somebody who says this question can't be answered? You say, this is an unambitious, uh, faith-ridden person. <laughs> well, they say it's not only can't be answered, but can't be answered in principle. No matter how much knowledge and science advances, it's impossible to answer. But think of the hubris and the preposterousness of a person who says, I know this question can't be answered. That's the strangest thing for a person to say with a 
brain with 50 trillion synapses. Yes. He's saying, I don't know how to do it. To say no one can do it is to say, I'm so smart that I can predict that nobody else will ever get a better theory. <laughs> and that's how I view those philosophers. They're saying, I'm so smart and I can't solve it, therefore no one else can. <laughs> what a strange thing to say. Minsky had no bounds for his intellect. He'd venture far beyond brains, minds, and souls to the universe and its foundations, like the radical idea that our whole universe could be a fake. It's perfectly possible that we are the production of some very powerful, complicated programs running in some big computer somewhere else, and there's really no way to distinguish that from what we call reality. Maybe we are being simulated by some rather large, dumb program. Uh, maybe it simulated the, all of evolution. It was set up by someone who wanted to see what would happen on a planet like Earth. Even if we were simulated, we might be able to find some technique that would notice some of the grain of the computer being used is showing through a little bit. So what would you feel if you found those anomalies so that that indicated that this was a simulation. Oh, I'd be very excited because uh, first it would mean that the universe was more easy to understand than we had thought and that we might even find ways to change it. Would also mean though that, that our level of reality is not the ultimate reality and that you can do all your nice little things in our world but that you have no understanding of what the real reality may be. Yes, and uh, that might be a great thing because Otherwise, we have to say, is this all there is? <laughs> so wouldn't it be nice to know that we're really part of a bigger universe? When you look at the world, what do you think are the things that really exist? It's hard to know what to do with the word exist because after uh, a career in computer science, we know how to make simulated worlds and we wonder what it's like to be in them. Now, you could ask, do the animals or do the people in these simulated computer games exist? And if you were to look inside, you'd find that usually they don't have any minds at all. Well, I think in the next 20 years, the characters in the computer games are going to get more and more complicated. And eventually they may have several levels of cognitive activities. So now you could ask, do those people exist? And you could say, no, they're just simulated in a program. But eventually, maybe they'll have programs as large as those in our own human brains, and those processes do everything that we can do. So now you could ask, for all we know, you and I don't exist in a physical sense. We're just being simulated by a fairly big computer somewhere. So you can't ever know that you exist. You might be a simulation. Or maybe we're just what a program would do if the computer were turned on and it's not even running because it has the same logical possibilities. But how could we not be turned on even if we're a simulation? First, it could be a program that's running on a computer. Second, it could be a program that some programmer is just thinking about. Third, it could be a program that nobody's even thought of, just one of the possible programs. And that's where I think we have to stop. That's the only kind of existence that makes sense because the others are trivial. It's the process itself that's the real thing, and it doesn't have to exist in any ordinary sense. It's just possible. So you're, you're defining real as possible. I Anything don't... possible is real, but there's no independent uh, sense of reality. Yeah, so I wouldn't use the word real at all. I think it's obsolete and unnecessary. And, and However, it makes sense to talk about what's happening in this universe, which is the one that we're stuck in. So if we could be living in a simulated universe controlled by some kind of super beings, what about living in an actual universe created by some kind of God? I couldn't have imagined Marvin believing in such supernatural things, but I couldn't help asking him why. Let me ask you about the spiritual world, the world of souls or God or angels or things that many people believe populate an immaterial world. I don't see any use for them. The spread of religion has uh, been an amazing phenomenon for thousands of years. And uh, it seems to me it's psychologically a wonderful device. Take all the questions you can't answer and give them a name. <laughs> so somebody says, well, God did that. And the right question to ask then is, well, how does God work? And they regard that as rude. 
So there's something strange about theology. It's a system of thinking which teaches you not to ask questions. And so I think it's basically incompatible with science. When we grow up, our parent is gone and there's no one to teach us, but we still have that slot in our brain for the marvelous creature who's going to give us the knowledge we need. And you might as well call it God or Satan or whatever is your uh, local religion. So, so we're built with an instinct to look for someone to tell us what to do. And that was the main way we learned for our first five years. And it's still there. And I think it should be removed at some point. But nobody has found the place in the brain where this is and found out how to <laughs> remove it. The trouble with religion is it picks particular things like why are we here or what created the world or what should we do in various conditions and lots of these can be studied and understood a little better by thinking more but our cultures find ways and it's the cultural rather than the individual who say we like things as they are don't think about this don't change it what you should do is told by this book and that's very convenient. It saves a lot of time. <laughs> At any period, if there are questions science can't answer because there are no tools, then why knock yourself out? The only trouble is that most of the time those questions could be answered if you knew more. Like what happens after death? Well, we don't need death. There's no reason why people should die. Right now we know lots of genes that cause disease. In a hundred years we'll know a dozen genes that cause aging. Maybe people will live for 400 years then. Shortly after that, we'll find ways to put our minds into machines, and then you can make backup copies and live forever. Religion <laughs> is why we couldn't do this 2,000 years ago, because mainly it stopped science. Believing in God is why we're all going to die today. Whereas if we had promoted science instead, we'd all be immortal now. Isn't that a funny paradox? So if you look at the short-term effects of religion, they're great. They make stable societies, except when they go crazy, which is frequent. Mm -hmm. And they save a lot of trouble and they do social services. In the long term, they guarantee death. <laughs> and they're very bad for us. And almost everyone who is alive today is eventually going to die because the 2,000 years in which science did not progress didn't happen. Religion. So I think death will go away and we don't need to pray for it. We have to work for it. <laughs> Always provocative, Marvin's views were as incisive as they were disruptive. I recall that in 1999, when I'd first spoken with him, I asked Marvin to distinguish between reason and faith. Most religions, the idea is that, well, there are certain questions we can't decide in any such way. and. Uh, so it's important to have faith. And if you're very good at having faith, then uh, it means you're not so good at critical thinking. I asked Marvin what people think about his outspoken, unconventional ideas. I don't care very much what other people think about me, so it's hard to intimidate me in that sense, unless, uh, unless it's Richard Feynman or someone. And it doesn't matter that he's dead. I, I have a very good copy of him, and if I say something, uh, too speculative, I can hear and say, well, what would be the experiment for that? What about an organizing principle to characterize Marvin Minsky's way of thinking? I'd select, how does it work? Well, to me, the word sure is when a cognitive process has turned off all other processes that can cast doubt on a particular statement. Being sure is not being sure. Being sure is a process saying, I'm not going to change my mind for a long time. <laughs> I myself am not a reductionist. I do not expect the mind to ever be explained entirely by the brain, nor do I reject outright the existence of God. And things beyond the physical, to me, are not impossible. Yet I would rather listen to Marvin arguing against my views than to almost anyone arguing for my views. Marvin had heavy-duty opinions. He was a strong atheist. But irrespective of one's beliefs, one can appreciate, dare I say enjoy, his disarming candor and blunt insights. A personal favorite? Unless you say how God works, saying that God exists doesn't explain anything. 
If there is a God, I'd be disappointed if Marvin isn't one of God's favorites. Marvin Minsky personified the kind of incisive, unambiguous thinking that Closer to Truth celebrates. Philosophers and scientists of all manner of belief, unbelief, and non-belief. It may be 100 years before history can assess the role that this one human being played in transforming our world. The impact of artificial intelligence, so pervasive, so woven into the social fabric, would not be as it is had not Marvin Minsky been among us to bring us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.